Hi, I'm Dr. Sean Kalick. I'm from the Department of Military History up at the, Com uh, the Command General Staff College in Leavenworth, and I have the honor of introducing Gates Brown today's speaker. Gates is a local boy from Kansas. Uh, God is, is working on his PhD here at Kansas. I almost said Kansas State because I went to Kansas State, so sorry. I, yeah, d don't boo, all right. But uh, Gates' background is uh, got, a, got his bachelor's degree from Pittsburgh State. Got a commission in the Army as an armor officer, a uh, veteran of uh, Iraqi freedom, a uh, wounded veteran. Uh, came back from Iraq, worked at Fort Leavenworth for a while, became uh, involved in the Wounded Warrior Program, and is now finishing up his PhD at KU on Eisenhower's deployment of IRBMs to Europe. So he's a member of the Department of Military History, and without further ado, Gates Brown. All right, thank you, Dr. Kalick. One of the things that I had to think about when uh, trying to come up with the idea for this talk is where do you start the Cuban Missile Crisis? Uh, most folks, it starts maybe in the beginning of October when the United States intelligence community starts to realize something's going on. Maybe it starts 16 October when the president actually finds out about the intelligence. But I think that that's a little too narrow. Because from the Soviet Union's perspective, and then the Cuban perspective, this starts in the late 1950s. And so it's going to take a little bit. We're going to get to the crisis, the, the 12 days in October, but we're going to have to go through some other events before we get there. And hopefully that's going to provide a, a different narrative from the traditional 16 October, the president finds out, 22 October, he addresses the nation, and then 28 October, Khrushchev kind of ends the crisis by saying that the, uh, the missiles will be removed. <clears throat> this takes place in uh, an era of, of heightened tensions. And looking at the audience, looks like a lot of folks obviously familiar with the Cold War. It's not necessarily true with my generation and younger. The Cold War doesn't resonate as much, but you understand how that tension really did permeate uh, international relations. It permeated domestic politics. And so... When we talk about this, it's important to understand that, that there's a lot of uh, mistrust, that there's, that there's some miscommunications here. And the, the image that I have of the Cold War is that there's a red phone on the desk of the president. If he needs to talk to the premier of the Soviet Union, all he needs to do is pick it up and he's instantly patched in. But that's not the case at this time. That happens after the Cuban Missile Crisis as a result of some of these miscommunications that we're going to talk about. So the communications happen at summit meetings when the two leaders are actually sitting down face to face. And it happens through letters and telegrams that go through the different embassies. And that causes some lag. And that's going to provide some opportunities for Kennedy. It's going to provide some frustrations for Khrushchev. But it does impact the crisis. The other thing that is important to understand is the, how the personality conflicts enter into this. And so we'll start off looking at the two men. We'll discuss Kennedy. How does he work as a leader? How does that differ from Eisenhower? How does he understand his position as President of the United States and how does he hope to work with Khrushchev? And then we'll look at Khrushchev. What's his background? What does he hope to do as Premier of the Soviet Union? And how does the election of Kennedy provide what he hopes will be a little bit of an open door to maybe a more peaceful coexistence with the United States. And then we'll discuss the military conflicts that occur before the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, the Bay of Pigs is the obvious one. And then the other one's the deployment of intermediate range ballistic missiles to Turkey in the late 1950s. And we'll look at how those two conflicts start to raise, start to increase the tensions between the Soviet Union and the United States. And then how does how does Cuba get involved in this? And then we'll actually hit the crisis. And we'll talk about how does the president find out about what's going on in Cuba? What are his initial policy choices? How does he go from uh, a very aggressive stance of possibly airstrikes followed up by an invasion to, to a quarantine idea? How does, he, how does that policy choice evolve? How does he use the executive committee differently than the National Security Council and the CIA in light of the Bay of Pigs and what happened there. And then we'll talk about the resolution. What happens to kind of turn the corner in the crisis? And how does Castro figure into this? How does Khrushchev uh, work with the Cubans? 
how does the offer of IRBMs really play into the resolution of the Cuban Missile Crisis? And then we'll discuss a little bit of the aftermath. What are some of the, the big um, follow-throughs for this? The obvious one, the communication improvement. You do have an installation of more of a red phone. It's not quite the red phone on the president's desk. And then there's also a limited test ban in the aftermath of the Cuban Missile Crisis. So Kennedy, he is a son of privilege. He's, he, kind of, he goes from political success to political success. He's not used to losing. And when he comes to office, he hopes to continue to bring that youthful vigor. When he runs, he's not able to put himself up as, as strong in national security as Eisenhower was because he doesn't have the military background that Eisenhower did. But he has two planks that he thinks provides a good counterpoint to what his administration will do in comparison with Eisenhower. One of those is the missile gap. And he runs on the idea that the Soviet Union was outpacing the United States in its missile capability and its number of missiles. He finds out that that's not necessarily the case, but it does make, a lot of political, make up a lot of political ground for him. The other one is he runs on the idea that Eisenhower wasn't as strong against communism as he would be. Instead of allowing communism to, to continue to try to expand a little bit, Kennedy would be more forceful and try to constrict communism. And that's going to that's gonna influence his decisions with the Bay of Pigs. The other thing that Kennedy uh, brings to office is a different type of decision making. Eisenhower works in a very bureaucratic fashion. He has a National Security Council, which he meets with almost weekly. He has specific heads of departments that take in information, provide course of action recommendations to him, and then he as a president makes those decisions. Kennedy feels like that's too constrictive. Kennedy wants to operate in a more ad hoc manner in, in that he forms specific groups made up of what he feels would be the best advisors for a specific crisis, and then he'll move on once that crisis is resolved. And we'll see how that comes into play with the Cuban Missile Crisis and how it differs from the Bay of Pigs when he's still using the National Security Council, not specifically in the way that Eisenhower does, but he still uses some of those decision-making tools that Eisenhower used in the Bay of Pigs crisis, or Bay of Pigs, and then how does that translate to the Cuban Missile Crisis. Kennedy, when he meets Khrushchev, he hopes to find someone that will be a good partner for at least decreasing some of the tensions. But he comes away from his first meeting at the Geneva summit, and he doesn't feel like he's made the progress that he wants. He doesn't think that he can really trust Khrushchev to be a partner in peace. And some of that is because Kennedy just doesn't trust communists in general. And again, it feeds into this general idea of the Cold War. You can't trust the socialists, because they're always looking to defeat capitalism. And that's not that it's not true, but Kennedy doesn't feel like he can really work with Khrushchev. Khrushchev, on the other hand, comes from a completely different background. He grows up as a pig farmer, and then he works his way from the very low rungs of the Soviet party system all the way up to be premier of the Soviet Union. So he learns how to operate within a bureaucracy. He learns how to, to try to play groups against each other. The problem with Khrushchev is, as he finds out during his uh, almost 10 years in office, things have changed after Stalin. Stalin is able to work the Soviet system in a very effective and efficient manner because he's Stalin. Khrushchev finds a changing paradigm. And so he's not, he doesn't have the freedom of movement that he wants because what he wants to do is try to shift away from a military focus to try to increase the quality of life for the Soviet citizens, to show what socialism can really do for them. The problem that he has is he has some significant military threats, and he has to solve those first before he's able to make that pivot. And a couple of those we'll talk about. The IRBMs in Turkey are a significant thorn in his side, and then the the contest between China and the Soviet Union about who really is going to lead the socialist revolution. All those are issues that Khrushchev finds himself confronting that Stalin didn't have to confront in the same way. And Khrushchev finds his policy choices kind of narrowing to a point where deploying missiles to Cuba makes sense for several different reasons. When he meets Kennedy, Khrushchev also comes away unimpressed. Khrushchev hopes to find a partner for a peaceful coexistence. But he fears that Kennedy's not going to have the backbone to stand up to those in his, in his administration who would push him to war. 
And because of that, Khrushchev doesn't feel that he'll be able to make the strides towards peace and make that pivot to a more consumer-focused economic model because Kennedy won't be able to fend off the hawks in his administration. So both of these leaders approach each other with a certain amount of distrust. They both see the enemy and the other as in some ways more successful. With Kennedy, he sees the expansion of communism in the late 1940s and 50s. You have the fall of China, you have the Korean War where communism fights capitalism to a standstill, and then you have the problem in Indochina which creates North Vietnam and South Vietnam. In many ways it looks like Asia is falling to the communist. And then with the revolution in Cuba, it seems possible that you might have a communist government 90 miles south of Florida. And you can debate a lot about where you draw the strategic line in Asia, but everybody agrees that you can't have a communist country 90 miles south of the United States. So in Kennedy's eyes, this is a significant problem. The communists seem to be expanding, and how is he going to combat that? Because one of his big planks as far as national security in the campaign, was he was going to be forceful. He was going to push back against the communists in a way that Eisenhower didn't. For Castro, or for Khrushchev, the United States is superior in missile technology. And in the late 1950s, it seems that the, the balance is in favor of the Soviet Union. But Eisenhower knows that's not true because he has access to classified intelligence from the U-2 program. However, in the early 1960s, that information starts to become public. And everyone knows now that the Soviet Union is behind in terms of its missile production, in terms of its missile capability. And, Kash and Khrushchev struggles with how do you address this inequality in the balance of power? Because the United States has the capability to hit Soviet targets, and the Soviet Union doesn't have a requisite capability. So both of these leaders feel in some ways that they're, op that they're operating from a position of disadvantage. We haven't really talked about Castro in this, although I kind of stumbled his name out a little bit earlier. But he's not important in, in the fact that he's dictated to in many ways. Khrushchev offers the missiles. Well, of course, Castro is going to take them. When Khrushchev takes the missiles away, Castro complains, but there's nothing he can do to stop it. And so this, kind of, this crisis happens to Cuba and to Castro. Castro is not necessarily an independent actor in this as much as he tries. So the first military conflict that we're going to talk about is the Bay of Pigs. And this starts, the planning for this starts under Eisenhower. And it begins as a small covert operation. But as most military missions do, you have a lot of mission creep. And so when Kennedy comes into office, it's expanded. You've got the Air Force supporting the landings. You've got a daytime mission in a uh, landing spot that's close to avenues of approach, close to transportation networks, close to population centers. And Kennedy realizes if he goes through with this, there will be no doubt that the United States supported this landing. It'll be obvious. It will be public information. And if it goes south then he'll be tarred with that failure, and he doesn't want that to happen. So he starts to pare back some of, these, uh, some of the U.S. supports. He removes the airstrikes. He changes the landing location. He changes the time of day. Instead of in daylight, it's going to happen at night. And the assumption is that doesn't matter. You don't need a big overt push because the Cuban people want to overthrow Castro. Once we get the exiles on the ground, the Cuban people will rise up, and the revolution will start. But that's not the case. And Kennedy comes away from the Bay of Pigs, and he feels that the National Security Council and the intelligence, administer and the intelligence agencies really let him down. That nobody stood up and said, Mr. President, how you have this planned, it won't work. Everybody continued to say, yes, Mr. President, we'll continue to execute. And it's a difference of cultures. Because with the military, if you tell the military to execute, the military will execute. But Kennedy expected one of the senior leaders to say, stop, Mr. President, we've gone too far. And so when he approaches the Cuban Missile Crisis, he doesn't return to that well again. He doesn't go back to the National Security Council. He forms a completely different committee to address this crisis, and it shows that in some ways he's lost faith in some of the senior military leadership and some of the senior intelligence 
analyst that advised him in the Bay of Pigs. But from the Soviet and the Cuban perspective, the Bay of Pigs shows that the United States is not going to accept the Castro regime. So Castro, he starts his revolution as a nationalist. Although Che Guevara is high in the regime and he's a, a devout communist, Castro makes it clear in the beginning that he wants this for a nationalist reason, not to expand socialism into Cuba. But with the Bay of Pigs, he realizes that the United States is not going to accept that. The United States won't allow him to rule in peace, so he has to find somewhere else to go for support. And so he starts to look to the socialist world, the Soviet Union and China. For Khrushchev, it's another opening. Perhaps he can help this new revolution stay and put a communist stamp on it. And we'll see how that feeds into another, uh, another issue that Khrushchev continues to struggle with, the rise of China. But parallel to this is the deployment of intermediate range ballistic missiles to Turkey. And these weapons had a range of about 1,500 miles, and they could carry a warhead that uh, had a yield of one and a half megatons. For some reference, World War II, the uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombs, had a yield of about 15 to 20 kilotons. So a megaton is, is about 100 times stronger than a kiloton. So this is a dramatic increase. And these weapons can penetrate deep into the Soviet Union. Well, the Soviet Union doesn't have an answer for this. Khrushchev decides to approach strategic weapons in the early part of his administration and bet on the intercontinental ballistic missile in favor of a large strategic bomber force. The problem is, by the late 1950s, the Soviet ICBM program hasn't had the success that they had hoped. And so they have a couple dozen of, IC, of intercontinental ballistic missiles, but that doesn't compare to the 120 IRBMs that the United States has deployed to Western Europe. And so when Khrushchev's looking at how do you address this inequality in the balance of power, Cuba starts to look like a pretty impressive place because it would allow him to put missiles 90 miles off the coast of Florida. And they have some intermediate range ballistic missiles with ranges of 1,500 miles and 2,500 miles. But that doesn't help you if your only place you can put missiles is in the Soviet Union. You have to have somewhere else to put them if you're going to hit domestic targets. So that's one reason he looks to Cuba for these missiles. The other thing that he continues to struggle with is the rise of Mao and the Chinese Communist State. Throughout the 1950s, the Chinese help in the Korean War and the Chinese help in Vietnam. And Mao starts to question if he should be taking all the direction from Moscow because it seems that the Chinese have a big hand in exporting the revolution. And if that's the case, then shouldn't they be the ones leading the socialist world? From the American perspective, during the 1960s and late 1950s, communi communism still seems to be a monolith, that everything emanates from Moscow. And for Khrushchev, if he were to lose that, if he were to lose the reins of power and have a bipolar communist world, that would be a big loss for prestige of the Soviet Union. So he has to find some way to reclaim that leadership of the communist revolution. And deploying missiles to Cuba gives him the ability to kill two birds with one stone. It addresses that inequality in the balance of power as far as missile capability, and it also shows that the Soviet Union is the one that's supporting and defending new revolutions across the world. So these are the missiles that we're talking about. In the middle, you can see are the ICBMs, and the green ones on the right side are all Soviet. The silver on the left are all uh, American. The two missiles that are going to Cuba are the far right, and the SS-4, SS-5, the Soviet nomenclature is R-12 and R-14. And then in the middle, the Jupiter and Thor, those are the missiles that the United States deploys to Western Europe. But it's not just about missiles. This deployment is a combined arms team. It has 50,000 Soviet troops. There are four motorized rifle regiments. There's dozens of tactical nuclear weapons, in addition to the uh, 24 and 36 medium-range ballistic missiles and intermediate-range ballistic missiles. You have 
42 light jet bombers. Six of those are capable of carrying small nuclear warheads on the scale of uh, tens of kilotons or smaller. You have 40 MiG-21 fighters that are deployed to Cuba. There are 72 surface-to-air missile launchers that are deployed, and these are capable of downing a U-2. In addition to the air assets and the ground assets, you have some coastal defense forces. 80 cruise missiles with 110 nautical mile range, 32 cruise missiles with a 50 nautical mile range, and 12 patrol boats uh, cap equipped with missiles, each with a 25 nautical mile range. So you see that the overt purpose of this is simply to prevent the U.S. invasion of Cuba. That's why you have a robust ground force. That's why you have these air defense assets and these air assets. But they're the missiles. And the missiles are the thing that kind of puts this over the edge. The soldiers who make the trip, they go in one of two ways. Some get to go in a troop transport, and whenever a plane flies by during the day, they have to scurry down below deck in the hold. In fact, they spend much of the time in the daylight in the summer in the hold of the ship. You can imagine how comfortable that is. And then there's the other side. They get to go across on cruise ships. And they're told to wear Caribbean clothing, take as many pictures as possible, really play up the idea of being a tourist. So depending on which, which route you took, it could be a really enjoyable trip or it could be a very long transatlantic voyage. Now, the United States detects the increase in shipping almost immediately. But they don't know why the Soviet Union is sending so much shipping across the Atlantic. So they have a couple of different tools they use to try to figure out what's going on. The U-2, everyone's probably most familiar with, that comes online in the late 1950s. It has a uh, ceiling of 70,000 feet and has a range of about 3,000 miles. It has two different cameras. The B camera, which is actually the, the primary camera, a little confusing, it has a resolution of six inches at 70,000 feet. So it is an amazing piece of uh, photographic technology. And then the tracking camera, which is what the Air Force actually uses, and it takes a horizon picture of whatever the pilot is, is flying over. And that's used for targeting data. The resolution's a lot less, and the angle it makes it a little more troubling to figure out exactly what is on the ground, but the Air Force doesn't have the mission to interpret these photos anyway. They're just supposed to get targeting information from it. But we'll see that the Air Force goes ahead and tries to interpret these photos for their own use anyway. And then there's the Corona satellite. And the Corona satellite had two reels of film in it. When we talk about a reel of film, it's hundreds of feet of film. And once a reel was used, it was jettisoned from the satellite, entered back into the atmosphere, and that plane down there in the bottom right is actually picking up a reel of film from the Corona satellite. It, takes about 10, it took about 10 days for the satellite to be launched, take the photographs, put the photographic reel back into reentry, retrieve it, develop it, and analyze it. So the Corona satellite has a little bit of a lag time. But the benefit is nobody knows the Corona satellite's overhead. You don't get as clear a picture, but you don't have to answer questions about why a satellite's invading a nation's airspace. The U-2, on the other hand, has a lot clearer picture, but by this time, everyone knows when a U-2 is flying over. They have the capability to detect it through radar. So it, it's problematic. You have to answer questions, awkward questions, about why are you invading our airspace. On 29 August, a U-2 finds SAM sites in Cuba. But these surface-to-air missile sites make sense if all the Soviet Union is doing is try to prevent an invasion of Cuba. So Intelligence analysts believe the Soviets are doing something, but they, they don't have enough evidence to really justify a full-scale crisis at this time. Because Kennedy continues to tell the Soviet Union and the world that the United States will not allow the deployment of offensive weapons to Cuba. And Khrushchev counters that any attack on Cuba will be considered an attack on the Soviet Union. So these SAM launchers don't really fit the bill as, as an offensive weapon because the only thing that they can really hit are planes flying over Cuba. But this does spur the administration to continue to investigate, to continue to find out what's the reason for the SAM launchers. And a month later, a U-2 finds nuclear-capable bombers on a ship bound for Cuba. And this changes the game because these are in that, that middle ground. They have a range of several hundred miles, and so they can definitely go into U.S. airspace and drop a nuclear weapon, 
in U.S. territory. And so this starts the, the administration really thinking of this in, in a crisis, uh, in terms of a crisis. And the Secretary of Defense, Robert McNamara, gives orders to the Joint Chiefs of Staff to begin mobilization in anticipation of executing some of their, uh, con some of their plans for reaction to a crisis in Cuba. And that includes an invasion, an airstrike, and a blockade. So the military starts movement for this because it takes weeks for the military to be prepared to conduct one of those missions. And we'll see when Kennedy actually gets the information and talks to the Joint Chiefs of Staff, this colors their perception of how the administration is attacking this program or this crisis. On 14 October, another U-2 flies over and it, deco it takes pictures of what they think is an actual launch site. And when we talk about pictures, this is what we're looking at. And you can see, uh, if you can imagine it without the labels, it's not really obvious exactly what you're looking at. You have to really know what to look for. And so there's a lot of art, there's a lot of science in reading and interpreting what these photos are. But this is a photo, this is a, like the photo that comes back on 14 October. And the Air Force gets the tracking reel, they develop it, they have an Airman First Class who's that headquarters kind of resident missile guy, and they have him look at the photos and, and just to see what he can make of it. And he notices that the, the construction site has kind of a hemispherical organization to it. And he remembers that he's seen a lot of these in Eastern Europe when the Soviets are constructing intermediate range ballistic missile launch sites. And he tells his superiors that he thinks the Soviet Union is actually building missile sites in Cuba. But the Air Force doesn't have the authority to interpret this. And so it kind of stays within the Air Force for that day. The next day, the CIA is able to take its B reel, develop it, interpret it. And they come to the same conclusion. But McGeorge Bundy, the special assistant to the President for National Security Affairs, doesn't want to disturb the President that night because the president just returned from a very strenuous trip. He wanted to give the president one more day to sleep, to get his energy before the crisis really started. And so 16 October is generally the, the day this, this kind of starts because that's when President Kennedy realizes or is informed about the missiles in Cuba. And he's furious. He meets with his executive committee, which is a committee that he creates to deal with this crisis, and members of that include Douglas Dillon, Secretary of Treasury, Dean Rust, Secretary of State, George Ball, the Undersecretary of State, Robert McNamara, Secretary of Defense, McGeorge Bundy, Special Assistant to the President, Theodore Sorensen, the Presidential Counsel, Robert Kennedy, Attorney General, General Maxwell Taylor, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, and General Curtis LeMay, Chief of Staff of the Air Force, John McCone, Chief of the CIA, Adelaide Stevenson, Representative of the United Nations, and Kenneth O'Donnell, Special Assistant to the President. So you see that this is a little different makeup than just the National Security Council. It has other members. And as the crisis evolves, this goes from being a body that offers course of action recommendations to being more of a sounding board for the President. And the President goes to uh, fewer and fewer members until it's really uh, Robert Kennedy, and the president talking about what to do and then presenting things to the executive committee. And so Kennedy kind of comes into his own as a leader through this crisis and takes ownership of his own policy decisions in a way that he felt he didn't do in the Bay of Pigs, but he's not going to make the same mistakes again. So as I said, Kennedy was very emotional when he finds out what Khrushchev's doing in Cuba. And he wants to do something. He wants either an invasion, he wants an airstrike, he wants a blockade, he wants some military action because he wants to be forceful. General Taylor cautions him and says, Mr. President, any airstrike is not going to solve 100% of our problem because we can't guarantee we eliminate all the missiles. We don't know how many missiles are on Cuba. We don't know if there are any missiles on Cuba, and if there are, we don't know if they're operational. If they are operational and we don't destroy all of them and the Soviets launch even one, that is a huge defeat for the United States. And this crisis escalates far beyond what it is now. So at the end of 16 October, there's no consensus about what to do. But the president tells the members of the executive committee to continue with their daily schedules, don't make any um, 
public comments because he wants this to remain secret as long as possible. That gives him the most freedom of movement. Two days later, photos show R-14 missiles. And the president kind of he's backed away from military action overtly, but he's still not sure exactly where he wants to go. An invasion is off the table. But now the discussion is, do you do airstrikes? Do you do a blockade? Both of these are acts of war. Llewellyn Tomlinson comes, he's a Soviet expert, he comes to brief the president. And he tells the president, if you use airstrikes, you remove any freedom of action from Khrushchev. Khrushchev will have to respond in a military manner. He'll have to attack. More than likely, that attack will come in Europe. So if you do that, this will then turn into a general war. And that further puts a wet blanket on talks of an airstrike. So it, it looks like the president wants a blockade, but the question is, how do you go about ensuring that you, may, you prevent any more missiles from coming to Cuba and you address the missiles that might already be there? Kennedy meets with the Soviet minister on 18 October, and he doesn't talk about the missiles to the Soviet minister, and the minister doesn't talk about the missiles to Kennedy, largely because the minister doesn't know about the missiles. And it shows that this is very close hold, for the Soviet Union. This is the first time the Soviet Union has deployed this many troops, atomic warheads, and guided missiles outside of the Eurasian landmass. And Khrushchev hopes to keep this secret as long as possible, because his idea is to spring this on the world fully formed after the midterm elections in the United States in November. And if he does that, the president will have to acquiesce, because obviously once you have dozens of missiles in Cuba that can range uh, most of the continental United States with megaton warheads, you can't launch a military action. You'll just have to accept them, much as the Soviet Union had to accept IRBMs in Turkey. But both of those assumptions are going to prove problematic for Khrushchev. 19 October, Kennedy meets with the entire Joint Chiefs of Staff for the first time about the crisis. And this shows he's not using the Joint Chiefs in the same way that he did with the Bay of Pigs. They come into the crisis a little bit later. But they come with the understanding that military movements have already started, that the administration is already looking at doing something aggressively. So when they, when they realize the full impact of what's going on, they expect the president to give some more direct advice or direct orders about a military action. And so that's what they offer the president. But the president has cooled on that idea already. And so for Kennedy, it seems that the Joint Chiefs of Staff really just want to rattle their sabers and get the military into the fight. But by this time, Kennedy is really hesitant to do that. He's looking at other options. On that weekend, prior to speaking to the nation on uh, Monday, 22 October, new intelligence showed that there were eight R-12s and the R-12s have the range of about 1,500 nautical miles, so they could hit anything in the eastern United States. That eight R-12s capable of launching in eight hours were in Cuba. And this is kind of the, the final uh, straw for an airstrike, because Kennedy knows that if he launches an airstrike, there's no way you can guarantee 100% that all of those missiles are going to be destroyed. And now that he knows he has at least eight on the island operational, he doesn't want to take that risk. Prior to speaking to the nation, Khrushchev thinks that Kennedy doesn't know about the missiles because he hasn't heard anything. The Soviet minister met with the president. Nothing was said. It looks like this is going to work out in his favor. He's a little nervous, but things seem to be working out his way. And then his advisors tell him that the president has requested airtime from the national broadcasters. And Khrushchev really wonders if he's made the right decision because he doesn't he knows now that the president must have something important to tell the people, but he doesn't know what it is. But the problem is he can't retract the missiles. They're already too far into this. Now he has to push through because he, he can't just back down now without a fight. Prior to speaking to the nation, Kennedy wants to address congressional leaders, and he has a problem because one of them is fishing in the Gulf of Mexico. And so they actually send it was a minority whip, Hale Boggs, and they send a plane over his boat and they drop a bottle with a note. And it says, get back to shore, contact the White House. And so he gets back to shore, contacts the White House, and finds out that he has to get back to the White House as soon as possible. 
So you can see, it, you know, it's not just miscommunication at the international level between these two heads of state, but also even within uh, internal politics. There are some problems getting in touch with people that you'd like to, to talk with. And the congressional leaders also want to see action, but Kennedy doesn't want to take that risk. When he talks to the nation on 22 October, he outlines the quarantine. He talks about increased surveillance with military preparation. And he tells the Soviet Union and the world, if there's an attack, the United States would consider an attack from the Soviet Union. While the speech is going on, Castro puts his military forces on alert. Khrushchev, after the speech, cancels all military leaves, cancels all discharges from the army, and orders his rocket forces into high alert. So this means that the warheads are actually mounted onto the missiles. The missiles aren't fueled, but it significantly decreases the time required to prepare them to launch. So this is not quite as close because there's going to be an increase in the DEFCON level for United States forces, but all the military forces are on high alert at this time. And this is you know, that brinksmanship game. We're moving to the edge of nuclear war and which side is going to back down. Instead of calling it a blockade, the president's very clear that this is a quarantine because a blockade is an act of war, and the president does not want this to be a war. So they go to the Organization of American States, and they ask them to pass a quarantine that will be several hundred miles off the coast of Cuba. It won't stop all ships going to Cuba, just ships suspected of carrying contraband, which would be uh, military hardware or offensive weapons. The problem is how you determine which ship you allow through and which ship not to allow through. When the quarantine goes into effect, Khrushchev initially orders his ships to continue their course. But then he has second thoughts and he orders them to stop. And for the United States, this is a break because they've had a couple of ships challenge the blockade or the quarantine, but these were ships carrying East German workers or these were ships um, flagged. These were different nationality ships flagged under the Soviet Union. So it wasn't that hard of a decision to make them, to let them go through because it was obvious they weren't carrying anything sensitive. But they worried what was going to happen when they had a troop transport challenge the quarantine or something that they knew was carrying these missiles challenge the quarantine. But that didn't happen. One problem with the quarantine, when it goes into effect, there's already a ship carrying warheads that's past the quarantine line. And so Khrushchev orders for that ship to make to the closest Cuban port. And so the quarantine goes into effect, but you already have nuclear warheads on the island. On 25 October, you have the 2nd Regiment of SS-4s operational. And so you have 20 launchers with 30 missiles active on the island. And you have the warheads also on the island. So if this conflict turns from just a moment of high tension to an actual military conflict, the Soviet Union has the ability to use these missiles to target the United States. On 27 October, the conflict takes another turn. And this is where that miscommunication comes in. A U-2 shot down. Khrushchev doesn't order the Soviet forces not to use the SAMs, these sur surface-to-air missiles, but he doesn't order them. Well, he doesn't order them to use them, but he doesn't also explicitly order them not to use them. And the so and the the Cubans continue to fire at U-2s, but the Cubans don't have the capability to actually shoot them down. They just fire to make themselves feel better. Well, the Soviet junior officer on the ground thinks that the conflict started, and so he gives the order to engage the U-2 with his SA-2, that surface-to-air missile. And it shoots down the U-2 and it kills the pilot. The executive committee had already kind of wrestled with this idea. If a U-2 pilot goes down, what do we do? And they decided that that would be a significant escalation because you've killed a U.S. service member. So we would think about airstrikes and an invasion because now it's a war. Khrushchev finds out about it early on 28 October. And for him, it shows that the conflict might be getting out of hand, that he's lost his ability to use this to his benefit, because if the United States reacts in the way that he thinks he would react, then it's going to be a war. But Khrushchev never deploys these weapons to start a war with the United States. He deploys them to give him that freedom of maneuver back home to focus on consumer issues, to try to 
de-escalate in some ways the tensions between the United States because it's the United States that started this in the first place by deploying those IRBMs to Turkey. And the IRBMs come into this a little bit as far as the resolution goes, but not in the way that the, the more traditional narrative has it. The Kennedy administration had already decided before the crisis that the IRBMs were going to be removed from Turkey. The question is, how do you do it in a way that the Turks will allow it? So once the crisis starts, Khrushchev sends two letters to Kennedy in quick succession. One doesn't mention the missiles at all. It discusses the threat of invasion of Cuba. And it says if the president would promise he wouldn't invade Cuba, then the Soviet Union would remove the missiles because the missiles are there simply to protect Cuba. The next letter mentions the missiles in Turkey. And it offers to President Kennedy, if you would remove the missiles in Turkey, then the Soviet Union would remove the missiles from Cuba. Kennedy decides to interpret the first letter as the real policy, the real option. And he sends Robert Kennedy through back channels to negotiate with the Soviet Union the quid pro quo for missiles in Turkey for missiles in Cuba. And so the, uh, the general understanding from the American perspective, before he had the release of um, the the administration's decision to get rid of the missiles in 62 before the crisis, these missiles played a key part in de-escalating the crisis because it seems that the United States, through covert, co covert channels, agreed to take the missiles out of Turkey and then the Soviet Union agreed to take the missiles out of Cuba. But really, the administration already made that decision. So in 28 October, Khrushchev orders the missiles removed. And it takes a couple of days for this to happen. But Castro, when he finds out about this, tries to stop it. Because for Castro, this takes away the thing that was going to protect him. The whole reason these missiles are there is to protect Cuba from invasion by the United States. And now he doesn't even have any option whether the missiles stay or go. So Castro tries to stop things. He doesn't allow UN inspectors to come in and verify that the missiles actually have left. And the Soviets and the US come with a workaround. They'll put the missiles on Soviet ships, and once the Soviet ships are in, are in international waters, they'll simply peel back the tarps. Uh, American planes will fly over, count the missiles, count the launchers, and everything will be okay. Castro also offers a five-point plan himself and with demands for what the United States has to do in order to solve this conflict. And they include things like stopping piratical acts against Cuba and not invading Cuba and lifting the embargo against Cuba, things that don't have any impact on the crisis at all. But with the aftermath, you do have a couple of important changes. The communication improves between the two leaders because part of the problem were the perceptions and the lack of a direct link between Khrushchev and Kennedy. They couldn't really communicate what the other wanted. And so you have the addition of of that red phone. It's actually a teletype machine in the Pentagon and in the Kremlin and not a voice communication that both leaders can talk to each other. You have the Jupiters removed from Turkey, but once again that's a decision that was made prior to the conflict. This just gives the administration an easy out. And the interesting thing is the missiles themselves are actually scrapped because they're obsolete. They'd only been deployed for four years, but in that four years they're basically worthless. The warheads come back to the United States, but the, the missiles themselves are gone. Kennedy finds his national security credentials burnished by this because it looks like he's the one that was able to stand up to Khrushchev and make Khrushchev blink. He didn't have to threaten the world with nuclear annihilation. That's what the Soviets did. So Kennedy looks like a calm, cool, collected leader who is able to challenge the Soviet bear and make Khrushchev back down. Khrushchev looks kind of amateurish because he took a gamble, but he overplayed his hand. He made some critical assumptions about his ability to keep this secret and assumptions about the U.S. reaction that proved to be unfounded. And in fact, in, in about a year, Khrushchev loses his position as premier of the Soviet Union because he's shown that he, can't, he can no longer balance the powers within the Soviet power struggle or power structure. And so the military wants him gone, the Communist Party wants him gone, and he can no longer play those sides against each other anymore. The Soviets, because of their inability to challenge the U.S. naval presence, go on a submarine building spree and go on an intercontinental ballistic mil missile building spree. 
And so Khrushchev makes this decision to try to alleviate the military tensions, to get the Soviet Union away from continuing to pour money into missiles and into military spending. But the Soviet Union actually has to do more of that in light of this crisis because it seems that the Soviet Union is ill-prepared to face the United States in a military conflict. It did end the spread of communism in the Western Hemisphere. The Soviet Union was no longer going to support Castro's desires to export this to other Latin American countries. And China also was cool on the idea of helping Castro export communism to Latin American countries. The Soviet Union will continue to support Castro for about a million dollars a day, but communism really doesn't expand in the way that Castro or uh, other leaders in the, communi in the uh, Cuban regime hoped that it would. Uh, barring any questions? That's so, yes. Uh, there's, there's a couple. One Hell of a Gamble, and the name of the author escapes me, is, is good. It's, it's in-depth. It lays out the timeline pretty good. And then um, Oxford University Press has a short book. It's a brief introduction to the Cuban Missile Crisis, or a short history of the Cuban Missile Crisis. And it's, like I said, it's about 120 pages. If you only read one book about it that you wanted to catch you up on all the historiography, on the new declassified information, I'd probably go to that book. It's shorter, it has a good bibliography, and they give a good annotated bibliography at the close of it to, to point you in different directions. Yes? Two things. How about Graham Allison's book on the missile crisis, and how about the film 13 Days, which I dusted off to watch again? <laughs> uh, accurate? You know, I, don't, I haven't seen uh, uh, 13 Days. It's very well done. I just wondered if it's fairly accurate. I, I don't know. I've heard good things about it. Um, what's the title? I, I haven't read it yet. But okay. I, I met him at Harvard one time, and I heard he'd written some very important history books up there. Okay. I'm not familiar with... Uh, unfortunately, I do better with titles than I do with authors sometimes. Oh, sorry. Okay. Good afternoon. I have a two-part question. You talked at some length about how Kennedy made his decisions regarding this crisis. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about how Khrushchev made his decisions and did he rely on others and who were these others that he relied upon that he incorporated in his decision making? Uh -huh. And my second question is, what are the lessons to be learned today about the about, from the community Cuban Missile Crisis that are useful to us in today's world, yeah. dealing with an even more escalated, higher technology, right. it's world tensions, etc. Well, for Khrushchev, he doesn't he doesn't bounce this decision off anyone really to make to deploy the missiles. Uh, he presents this as an idea, and then it's more an execu in execution mode. So once it goes south. He deals with the Presidium, which is kind of like his cabinet. And as far as specific uh, Soviet members of that group, I, I don't know their names. But he has to, he can deal with the Presidium, but the Presidium is also made up of folks who may or may not want his job. And so it turns into kind of a, um, not necessarily a contrarian, but it's not the same makeup as the executive committee where. President Kennedy was able to select group that group and work with it. Um, the Presidium starts to question why Khrushchev did this when it starts to go south. And so I think you see with Khrushchev, he, he's not as well served as Kennedy is. But that's largely because they're left out of this decision in the first place. He presents this to them and says, this is what I did, and I hope we can make something of it. And as far as what we can learn from it, I think you see especially when you broaden the context of the Cuban Missile Crisis, when you only look at the, the 12, 13 days in October, it seems like Khrushchev is ruthless, is um, tyrannical, that he's been pushing the world to the brink of nuclear warfare just so he can get some missiles in Cuba. But when you expand the context, you see that Khrushchev is trying to redress the balance of power issue that he feels the United States started. 
and we still deal with those problems in perception. The United States deploys missiles to Western Europe, not necessarily in an aggressive way, but in a way to try to uh, solidify NATO and calm some fears within the Western European alliance about what the United States' commitment is to that body. And it doesn't work out that way because the Soviet Union sees it as very aggressive. But from the United States' interpretation, these are simply defensive weapons. But when the, when the Soviets do the same thing, it's a very aggressive move in our interpretation. And we still struggle with that today. We think we act in one way, but our actions are interpreted by others in a very different way. And so I think that's probably one big issue we can still wrestle with. How do you ensure that your intent is communicated by your actions and you have to put yourself in someone else's shoes and understand how your actions come across and what their perceptions are because really that's the important issue is how do others perceive your actions and less what your intent is. Does that answer the question? Okay. Yes, white shirt, the, the mic's coming. My understanding was that the decision to remove the Jupiters from Turkey had been made well before the Cuban Missile Crisis. Yes. Was it just bureaucracy? Was it just slow in getting them removed? No. Um, the, the missiles, did I cut you off? No. Okay, good. The missiles, when they're deployed to Turkey and Italy and the United Kingdom, they have a political component and a military component. The military uh, value of the weapons is minimal at best when the, when the weapons actually are operational. But the political component is quite powerful because it shows how close that nation is to the United States. And there are only three NATO nations that agree to take these weapons on, the United Kingdom, Italy, and Turkey. So for Turkey, it looks as if they can kind of catapult themselves into a more senior position in Europe by allowing the United States to work closely with the Turkish government. But when the United States realizes it wants those missiles out of Turkey, it's now a political problem to get them out because that will remove some status from Turkey as a state within the European alliance. And so it's not a bureaucratic issue as much as it is how do you sell this to the Turks in a way that makes it go down as smoothly as possible what's going to be an unpalatable decision because they broached the subject with them, but the Turks are very clear they don't want the weapons removed from Turkey. But this provides a, a good rationale. Thank you. Yes, right here in the blue shirt. Coming. Um, Kennedy and Khrushchev met in Vienna, I believe, in 1961. Uh -huh. um, did Khrushchev come away from that meeting with the impression that Kennedy would not be very strong in a crisis or conflict? Well, I think Khrushchev comes away, not necessarily that Kennedy won't be able to stand up to a crisis, but more problematic is that Kennedy won't be able to stand up to folks in his own administration. There are some Cold War hawks inside the administration that Khrushchev worries in a crisis will bend the will of Kennedy. And so it's, it's not that he doesn't think he's effective as an international leader. It's, it's more troubling. It's that he has people around him who he might not be able to control, and they might actually control him. Yes. One account I read recently said that JFK actually wept with Robert when he recounted what happened in Vienna with Khrushchev. My understanding up to this point has been that it was a real terrible performance by Kennedy in Austria. Yeah. And it gave Khrushchev the, the opinion he could push Kennedy around and, and was a major reason or at least a... Yeah, a he doesn't come away with a, with a good opinion of what the president is able to do, and I think that's why it's not necessarily, it's true that Khrushchev thinks that Kennedy is weak, but it's one thing to be weak in an international crisis, and it's another, I think, a higher level to, sh to say that the president can't even stand up to those in administration, in his administration around him. So I think you're, that's, that's definitely a valid interpretation, and an extension of that is, is Khrushchev's feeling that not only will he be able to push Kennedy around, but more problematically, he might have to worry about dealing with some of these hawks in the administration that would 
force the president to go to war when Khrushchev doesn't necessarily want to go to war. Nope. Sir, if you have an opinion on the missile status worldwide today, would you share it with us? Um, you know, I, I really am not, uh, I don't have much, the, the problem that I see is there, there seems to be some move to get away from a concentration on a nuclear deterrent and almost uh, some assumption that nuclear weapons are somehow passe or, or ineffective. And I think that's because we've lived with the assumption that we control nuclear weapons very tightly, but that might not be true going into the future. So we might see nuclear weapons become even more important as, as other nations start to either try to get them or the control of nuclear weapons in certain nations comes under uh, more doubt than it was, especially in the Cold War and, and in the early period right after the Cold War. So I, I can't talk about missiles specifically, but I think nuclear weapons as a whole is something that is still an important defense issue, and it's probably going to become more important as, as other groups try to get those weapons or as international controls over those weapons uh, don't, are, are not as effective as we'd like them to be. Mm -hmm. Oh, we go there and then. How did the public perceive what was going on? Well, for the public, this is once they find out about the crisis and they find out uh, 22 October when the president speaks to the nation, this is a, a very scary event because, you know, for the American public, I can't, I, I can't speak to the Soviets, but for the American public, this kind of comes out of nowhere in a sense because they're not tracking the deployment of IRBMs to Turkey. They're not really putting the Bay of Pigs together with this crisis. To them, it seems like this comes out of the blue. Why is Khrushchev doing this? Is, is he really this mad Soviet dictator who's going to push us to the brink of war? And like I said, you have military, uh, an increase in military readiness. So you have the, once the speech happens in 22 October, you have a move to DEFCON 3. And then during the crisis, you have a move for military readiness to DEFCON 2, which is the highest rate of readiness that is going to occur throughout the whole Cold War, short of actual deploying troops to fight. So for the people it really seems like you're a breath away from nuclear war, and it, in some sense it's more troubling because why did Khrushchev decide to do this in the first place? Does that answer your question? Oh, we had, oh, yes. This is a follow-up to that last question. Uh -huh. I, I lived in, in L.A. at that time. I was going to UCLA graduate school that fall when it was going on, and I remember that people were really panicked. They were... Mm -hmm. They were storing uh, goods from the grocery stores. There was lines at the stores. So, so really, people were scared. <laughs> yeah, I can't imagine. I, I don't know the answer to this question uh, or even the data, but I'm curious about the role of the Russian uh, submarine. Yeah. Uh, and when they, what was the role in the Cuban Missile Crisis mm -hmm. and when they actually acquired the ability to launch nuclear weapons from a submarine, because I would think that if you could just put a submarine off the coast of the U.S., yeah. you're just duplicating exactly the fear that the Kennedys well, had in Cuba. And that comes out afterwards. At the time, the Soviets have a diesel fleet deployed to the Caribbean. And this diesel fleet, they have to surface after a certain number of days. And there's some subs in the area, but not enough. Not enough, certainly, to challenge a quarantine. And they, they have the capability to launch nuclear weapons, but that's a pretty aggressive move. And so after the crisis, the Soviet Union continues to build submarines because they didn't want to be outclassed again. So in reaction to the crisis, the Soviet Union really doubles down on submarines and tries to build more nuclear subs, tries to get subs with an increased uh, launch capacity. They have some in the during the crisis and deployed to the Caribbean, but not in numbers to actually stop the quarantine or challenge U.S. Uh, naval power. Or did you say that by 62, the Cuban people were disillusioned with Castro? No, no, they weren't. That was the assumption. The assumption was once the exiles hit in the Bay of Pigs that the Cuban people would rise up. And that's why Kennedy 
felt it was okay to strip some of the, the airstrikes, some of the overt support from the Bay of Pigs. But Castro had some very popular things that he did early in his revolution, uh, land reform, other economic reform, that put him apart from the Batiste regime and actually uh, created quite a bit of affinity with the Cuban people. And so when the exiles hit, they don't have that groundswell of support meeting them at the beach. They have Castro's military meeting them at the beach. And so it's a faulty assumption on the president's part, but that's because he's informed by the intelligence community that's talking to the exiles and not necessarily by human intelligence sources inside of Cuba giving him uh, more effective intelligence. In your opinion, with the communication improvements that we have today, uh -huh. how might this have played out differently at the time due to the lack of yeah. communications? Because today our CNN, uh, you know, Fox and everything, everybody is on top of everything if you just sneeze. Right. So I, how might this have played differently? Well, I think in, in some ways it probably would have been more difficult to, to deploy these with the hope of secrecy. Uh, as you said, there's much more uh, transparency now. And so would the Soviet Union have been able to deploy these weapons uh, you know, using this massive amount of shipping across the Atlantic? That probably would have been a little taller order. But on the other hand, we still struggle with these issues of perception and how our, our actions come across. And so I think you'd still have this problem of not linking the deployment of missiles in Europe to the Bay of Pigs and seeing this as one big conflict that the climax is the deployment of weapons to Cuba by Khrushchev, we still might look at it as three disparate events and still be shocked by Khrushchev deploying these missiles. I think, um, you know, communication, no, no amount of communication, if it's not done effectively, can really deal with misperceptions. But I do think that they have much more trouble doing this in a covert way. How much do you think uh, it would have mattered, like per Khrushchev's perception of how the different administrations would have reacted, influenced his decision to do this in the first place? Do you, if if he were dealing with another, a different president, like had it, like say had to be to deal with the Eisenhower administration. Oh, still. okay. Um, well, that's a good question. I think that Khrushchev he does this. In some sense, he sees Kennedy as someone that maybe he can he can push a little bit farther. But, you know, I think with Eisenhower, there's still the threat of massive retaliation, and maybe he would have hesitated under Eisenhower. Under Johnson, when you have a shift to flexible response and um, limited response, maybe he would have tried his hand with Johnson because Johnson wouldn't have promised to come out with a, a general atomic strike at the first provocation. He would have started low and, and continued to increase pressure. So I think under Eisenhower, maybe Khrushchev would have been a little more hesitant because the price to pay was so much higher. But uh, with Johnson, maybe would have taken the gamble as well because maybe you could fight a, a limited war, still deploy the missiles, and once they're operational, then it's kind of a fait accompli anyway. Uh, do you believe that the Soviets were aware that our naval blockade was superior to their ability to run the blockade and that's why it didn't happen? Do you feel they had that counterintelligence? Uh, no, I think once you have the quarantine, Khrushchev realizes that this might be more than he bit off. Or he, he might have bit off more than he could chew, if I get my metaphors correctly. He didn't want to start a war. He simply deploys these missiles to pr try to provide some freedom of movement for him. And you don't want to fight a war because that's going to demand you increase military spending. It's going to show that Khrushchev really didn't have control of the situation. And so I, I don't think that they necessarily evaluated the, the naval threat and decided that the United States had more assets than the Soviet Union did. I think for Khrushchev, he realized early on, once the United States was going to not readily acquiesce to this, that that meant he either was going to have to fight those weapons onto Cuba, which would entail a much broader conflict than he wanted, or he'd have to try to figure out some way to save face. 
And the way to do that is you stop the ships, you don't challenge the quarantine, and you try to, to work it out some other way. And, and in some ways, the Soviet Union does kind of come out ahead because although they lose the missiles in Cuba and they lose the bombers in Cuba, they get a naval base in Cuba. So they do get a warm water port, but they don't get the missiles. So I don't, I don't know. That's probably not a good trade for Khrushchev, but it's something anyway. Uh, during the crisis, there were two letters that Khrushchev sent, I believe, to Kennedy. Mm -hmm. And one of them, Bobby Kennedy, uh, just advised the president to ignore. Yes. And to uh, pay attention to the second uh, letter. Uh, could you expand on that a little bit? Yeah. It's, uh, those are the two letters in the beginning. One mentions the missiles in Turkey as a quid pro quo that... If the United States removed the missiles, then the Soviet Union would remove the missiles. The other simply asked for the president to publicly say he will not invade Cuba. And the first one, the first one it doesn't, missiles, doesn't mention the missiles. The second one actually mentions the missiles. The first one's written because the overt reason for deploying the weapons is to stop the United States from invading Cuba because these are defensive weapons, even though they can reach the continental United States with a megaton warhead, but they're defensive nonetheless. The second one is a way for Khrushchev to say, well, if I'm going to give up my missile ca capability, then you should have to give up your missile capability. But the president doesn't want that to be part of any public uh, agreement. And so they ignore that letter mentioning the missiles, and they concentrate on the first one, which simply requires a public promise not to invade Cuba. But through back-channel negotiations, Robert Kennedy does talk to Soviet, actually, uh, news correspondents, and uh, I forget which agency, but there was a, uh, a news correspondent who was taking information to the Soviets. And so Robert Kennedy works with him and says, behind the scenes, we'll take the missiles away from Turkey, because once again, the administration is, is already looking for a way to do that, but you have to agree to take the missiles away from Cuba. And so it, that's, that's another part of that miscommunication issue. You know, in this age of email, we're not used to, to letters getting in quick succession written days apart, you get an email, you get it in an instant. And in this situation, Khrushchev writes these letters a little bit different time, but the administration receives them in enough time to make it look like they could choose which one is the first and which one is the second. And they would obviously choose the one that came, that was most beneficial as the one that was most recent, and that's obviously what Khrushchev really meant us to, to work with. So that's, that's how the letter writing kind of affects the timeline of this. All right. Well, thank you very much.